Hi, I'm, I'm Sam Zakroff. I'm, I'm moderating, and I don't have a lot to say in introduction. So to my left is Victoria Bassetti of the Brennan Center, Guy Charles from Duke Law School, Rebecca Green from William & Mary Law School, and Danielle Lang from the Campaign Legal Center. Uh, the title of this panel is Courting and Selecting the Electoral College. We had substantial exchanges among the panelists, and we have no idea what this means, uh, <laughs> but uh, we will proceed. Um, and let me make a couple of introductory comments, and then each of the panelists will speak to eight to ten minutes, and then we will resume again. The last time I was at a conference on the Electoral College, was in 2003. Alex Kesar was there, um, and it was held at Columbia Barnard. And the theme was the following. We just had a contested presidential election where the popular vote loser won the Electoral College, and there is a crisis in the presidency, and something has to give. Things are going to change pretty quickly because the population won't stand anymore. We're coming up to the re-election of that minority president. As you all know, everything got resolved. And uh, so here we are again in the aftermath of a similar circumstance where there is a sense among large parts of the country that, thank God, we have an institution to prevent uh, the coastal elites from taking power, and the coastal elites gather in some neutral spot like west side of Manhattan or Cambridge uh, to complain about uh, the outcome. So that's great. Um, I want to pick up on a point that um, Amal made in the, last, um, in the last panel, which I think is key to all the comments that are going to follow. And that is there's real tension between the democratic sensibilities that we have today and the institutions that we've inherited. And I think that's what's at the core of all the debates about reform and all the sense of outrage, that there's an institutional setting that doesn't correspond to how we think about it. So when the Supreme Court in Bush versus Gore said, no one has a right to vote for president, that was a shocking statement for the bulk of Americans. It, it, it didn't resonate with how we think about things. And so I tell my students that the most important election in human history may well have been the American election for president in 1800. Not for any of the technical reasons we've described, but because in the modern conception of democracy, it was the first time that it was established that a head of state could be replaced peacefully by electoral means. This is just not a factor of the human experience, and it was something quite unusual. But now let me tell you something else about the election of 1800. There were 14 states at the time, large debates about whether something as trivial and irrelevant as Vermont should be allowed in to participate with the other 13, but nonetheless, they allowed it in 14 states. Of those 14 states, five had popular election for the president. The other nine, it was done by the state legislature by appointment, as is consistent with the constitutional text. So when we talk about Jefferson having been a landslide winner and Jefferson having a mandate, Jefferson won because the southern state legislatures used the three-fifth leverage in order to put him in office by appointment. That's why he was known as the Negro president. He was thought to be the illegitimate inheritor of the way that the southerners had gamed the electoral college system. It doesn't correspond. So uh, Alex Hayser made a point earlier about changing this is a problem of collective action. And there is a sense of how we coordinate. But let me make another historical point. We have seen exactly this debate play out in a different institutional setting. The Constitution doesn't mandate how the congressional delegations are made up. And so after the Revolutionary War, after the Constitution, modern Constitution, there was a mixed system. Some had at-large elections, they elected a statewide delegation, some had districts. It tended to be the smaller states that were at-large, tended to be the uh, um, at-large. The larger states tended to have districts, especially after the first fiasco with the Pennsylvania congressional delegation. 
And then it happened that the small states could take advantage of divisions in the large state delegations. And the large states realized they were having their lunch taken from them because they were divided and the small states could leverage their votes. So they started to go over to at-large elections. And then they realized that no state had an incentive not to have at-large elections because that would enhance their weight in the National Assembly, in the Congress. And the way they resolved this was they went to some supervening authority. And the supervening authority was Congress itself. And they said, we're stuck in this collective action dilemma. You think Arrow made this stuff up? No, they, they figured it out in 1842. They didn't have the terminology, but they, they had it all figured out. They said, we'll never get out of this cycle. And so what we have to do is we have to pre have a pre-commitment pact. They called it Ulysses and the Congress, right? They had an understanding that they were, that they were stuck. And what did they do? They said, by legislation in 1842, we will all agree to go over to single member districts. The problem we have in the electoral college setting is that the constitutional text disables the national legislature from playing that kind of collective action coordination role. And because of that, we have to think of these alternative strategies that we're going to discuss now. And that's a way of understanding why we're doing all this arcane discussion of a national popular vote or of a constitutional amendment or the, the litigation challenge to say, you have to break up the at-large elections. Everybody understands this problem, and if it was a matter of an ordinary provision of the Constitution, like the selection of the Congress, it could be handled as a legislative matter. We have a defect in the founding instrument that disables the one collective national entity that can do so as a legislative matter from handling it. So that's the introduction, I think that's all I had. That's the introduction. I have a question that we're going to come back to about the extent of that after the initial presentation. So we have an order, and I sent an email, and there was a logic to it. I don't remember what the logic was, but I do remember the order. So Guy goes first. <laughs> all right, I'll, I'll pick up from where uh, Sam, in many ways, left off. Um, which is, in many respects, the problem that we're dealing with today is one that is fundamental for election law scholars much more broadly. All right, It raises some of the features that Sam has already talked about. Uh, in one respect, you have a constitutional structure that has a particular understanding and view of political participation that is relatively archaic, um, at least, it, or at best, it is bimodal. That is, it reflects multiple, two views or even multiple views, but the dominant one is relatively archaic within a structural context that is deeply entrenched, um, and the levels of entrenchment um, may depend upon the type of issues, right? So to what extent does it make it necessary to amend the Constitution in order to, to, to change it, right? And, and within a, also a modern context in which it's not clear that our institutions are working optimally, right? So even if the Constitution did not make it so hard to amend, um, to, to, to amend itself, would we have a functioning Congress that can solve the collective action problem, right? So, so we have layers, this is something, a similar point that somebody made earlier. The problem here is multi-layered, uh, which, which creates then this loop with, that, that we're stuck in, right? So we have one, uh, a set of approaches by the Constitution, a particular conception of democracy, a particular understanding of political participation that generally reflects an elitist uh, understanding, although mixed in with some populist understanding, some Republican understandings, a view of the states as the unit of representation, so not just of the individual, but also of the state as units of representation, right? So you've got this mix that is reflected within the Constitution, and it's true of the Electoral College. And you have our modern sensibility of what political participation ought to look like, right? That is much more roughly populist, that is much more inclusive, um, that that has a an, an idea of political equality that is deeply inconsistent with that, that, that as we saw at the founding. So a clash of approaches, um, but also structural entrenchment layered upon 
um, a political, not just instability, but, um, but essentially gridlock, right? And then we get to resolve and think about these issues every three years just as at a different law school. And quite frankly, part of me, I'm fine with it as long as I get invited, right? So, uh, right, so in four or five years, just make sure that I get the invite, right? So it's not surprising then, given these, these structural entrenchment questions that we're dealing with, it's not surprising given the way that the Constitution um, is itself indifferent to a number of different types of questions, right? So Sam mentioned the fact that in many ways it's shocking. It's always a fun thing to teach that aspect of Bush versus Gore. When the, not only does the court say there is no right to vote for president, right? No right to vote there, but it's actually a contingent fundamental right, which is like a, the most amazing constitutional law invention, right? A fundamental right, but that is contingent, right? It's like, wow, how did you create that creature, right? So, so part of what's interesting with respect to our constitutional structure is the way that it hasn't resolved sort of the types of questions that we take, for, that we want to take for granted in modern, in our modern democratic uh, um, frame, but, but the constitutional framework has come, has come up with a different type of a political theory that goes in, in multiple directions, right? And the question is, how should we think about that and how should we resolve, we resolve it? Okay. I'm, I'm not going to have um, a, um, a silver bullet for resolving it, but I do want to take a page out of um, Larry Lessig's approach uh, here, which his approach, um, at least as, as I've learned from it and, and understand it, is an approach that attempts to see in what ways can one build commonality, that can we build commonality across divides. Okay? Now I think in order to, to do that, in order to build commonality across divides, at the very least we have to be able to articulate what our fundamental values are. Right? So I have the privilege of um, thinking about these questions of political equality as a black man in the 21st century. And I think for me it is in, in, indeed a privilege because you get to see the linearity, right? So if you sort of take the very long view in terms of arguments about political equality in the American context, not just in the, particularly in the last 50 to 60 years, right? You understand how, how strongly arguments with respect to political equality arguments with respect to political participation has had an impact on the polity and has changed our polity in significant and fundamental ways. So you could think about the Voting Rights Act, you could think about the one person, one vote reapportionment cases, but even in the last 20 years or so, if you had told me 10 years ago that the issue of political gerrymandering would have an impact on the national consciousness, I would have said that you are smoking something. Or we used to talk about the problem of felon disenfranchisement and thought there would be no political process solution because it doesn't make any sense for it to be a political process solution as a matter of public choice theory. But all of a sudden, these arguments with respect to political equality seem to be making their way across fundamental divides. And I think it is because the articulation of the values that are at stake um, have some type of appeal, notwithstanding the political incentives that sometimes run the other way, right? So one of the things that, I, that that I, that I want to say, and I, and I won't say too much more, but one of the things that, that I want to say is we ought to be clear in articulating what our fundamental values are and what the value choices are that we are, that we are making when we're trying to think about these questions of political participation. Because if we think about how change is made in this particular context, and if we take the very long view, we see that, that these questions of political equality and political participation do in fact have broad appeal, even across some aspect of, 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 of divides. All right, so, um, in, in, in one last point then to, to, um, to wrap up, I, I will, I promise, um, wrapping up here, um, when the case is made for political equality um, and we think about the the, in, the aspects within which the trade also that, that are being made, then there is, there is a response. Now that response will have to operate within the American context, right? So you have to take states seriously. You have to take the question of federalism seriously. So it might be the case that the change happens slowly across states and across time, right? But taking the long view before it gets nationalized, but taking the long view, 
at least I am um, relatively optimistic that change comes even when dealing with entrenched problems, when norms and values of equality and participation are clearly articulated, and even if they need to be clearly articulated repeatedly. And when the case is made for contrary and entrenched norms, that for contrary and entrenched norms, they can be modified if not uprooted. And I will stop here. Thank you. So to, to just follow up on the, the kind of the general confusion that a lot of us had about the, uh, the topic of this panel, I'll, I think part of the reason was is because a, a, a lot of us don't really think about who these electors actually are and how they're selected or courted. It's kind of to the majority of us about as relevant as asking the question, how is the lead Pfeiffer going to be selected in the Fife and Drum Corps that we're going to be seeing afterwards? But you know, since the rise of the party system, which uh, it was almost immediately, you know, immediately following the ratification of the Constitution, but more particularly since the advent of the Australian ballot and certainly since the Civil War, electors have been creatures, the actual electors have been creatures of the party system. And they've only sporadically been category experts in what it takes to be the chief executive of a $3.0 trillion budget, $2.1 million headcount organization. Um, or if it were if it were 1900, you might want your electors to be a little bit of an expert in the postal system and the custom house, and maybe with a, a little bit of a side interest in antitrust law, as the case might be. But our our, our electors are not those people. Uh, you know, I, I should add, of course, Bill Clinton was an elector in 2016. Um, he, so he probably was a category expert <laughs> in what it takes to be the the executive uh, uh, president, but but. Personal loyalty and party loyalty probably trumped his his expertise in that particular case in evaluating the candidate. So today, if you were a major organization who needed a presidential hiring committee that would be an independent body of superior characters left to the exercise of your of their own judgment, how would you set up that presidential hiring committee? Well, probably not the way we pick electors or court them. Um, so today. Uh, 27 states with about 275 electoral college votes select their electors largely via the party executive committees or in other ways that I would describe as strong party power selection systems. For example, in Pennsylvania, the presidential nominees themselves select their electors. So Hillary Clinton called up the, you know, the Pennsylvania Secretary of State and said, here are the electors I would like. Um, 30, the 33 other states plus the District of Columbia select their electors at their state party conventions. And I, they, those states represent about 263 electoral college votes. I would uh, kind of describe that as moderate party power systems that with a moderate level of control over the electors. In fact, in 2016, all of the faithless electors came from these states. They didn't come from the strong party systems. Um, and for what it's worth, there's even substantial variability within the 33 convention selecting states. Some of them, for example, select their electors at local district conventions and then ratify them at the statewide convention. In other cases, the electors are at large and certain people kind of put their names up and say, hey, I'd like to be an elector, and then the convention votes on them. In other cases, the state's exec, the, the, the party's executive committee puts a slate of electors before the convention and then the convention just sort of ratifies it. So, you know, there's there's substantial variability amongst all of these systems. It, but, but all of them share the trait that there is a, a very substantial level of party control over who the electors are. So I think that understanding this leads us down the road to understanding why we might care about the topic of this panel, which is that it's relevant, the answer to this uh, question is relevant to opening the door and assessing the probabilities that an elector will either be faithless or might actually do the job as originally intended. Um, and I think we can probably all put aside the notion that electors are going to do the job as originally intended um, and that they are selected in a way that best suits them to act as independent evaluators of a presidential candidate. So to focus instead on faithless electors, there are, of course, other variables besides merely the selection system that could play into determining whether or not they're faithless. 
Um, the first, which was alluded to in the second panel, is the contestation of the party primary. In other words, how hotly contested is the primary? Um, all of the convention states, the weaker party power ones, select their electors prior to the national convention. Um, and that means that in periods of high contestation or instability, um, the odds are higher that the party binds between the elector and the party are going to be looser or weaker than usual. Um, then another factor or variable um, is a sharp ideological or regional divisions. When you look at the post-1900 faithless electors, you can see a thread of racism running through it. So there were three faithless electors in 48, 56, and 68 who were kind of, who were propelled by, by racism. Um, or abortion issues in 1976, that was one of the, and then there's a smattering of other concerns here or there. Um, so kind of a, a strong ideological Fine. Then uh, another factor is the presence or absence of the penalty for acting as a faithless elector. Uh, today, you need to bear in mind that only 15 states provide any sort of penalty or enforcement mechanism for being a faithless elector. Others of them require pledges, but there's no penalty for breaking the pledge, uh, aside from you know being shunned or cast out of the party. Um, but I, I don't think that one can say that given that these provisions have necessarily had that much of an impact on faithlessness compared with the softer variables that might be in play in determining faithlessness. Um, Finally, there's also cabal intrigue and corruption. Um, so at the outset, of course, the framers uh, hoped that the creation of a transient and geographically diffuse body of men would, and of course it was men, would reduce the chances of cabal and intrigue. But, you know, we've got the internet now. So uh, that's not going to work. And in any event, so a survey of electors from 2000, 2004, 2008, and 2012 showed a very substantial number of them uh, received death threats, multiple contacts, and lobbying campaigns to get them to alter their votes. Um, so, uh, and then the final kind of variable that I was thinking about was closeness. Obviously, the closeness of the election is also a key variable in determining whether or not someone would be faithless. You know, overall, most modern faithless electors are, are exercising idiopa idiopathic, occasionally quixotic expressions of personal viewpoints uh, rather than, you know, kind of being true electors as we think of them, almost all of them are making personal statements. And they've only been able to do this because they're nestled deeply within an election process that guarantees that their decisions are safe, read irrelevant to the outcome. Um, now there's also some evidence that there might be a seed of faithlessness amongst more electors than we think. That same survey that I pointed to before shows that up to 11% of the 2000 to their 2012 electors reported having considered switching their vote. Uh, how seriously they considered it and why they didn't is an interesting topic, and that's a little bit of what we're what we're talking about. But overall, I think that the system of party control that we're talking about and all of these variables are not going to substantially change in the coming decades, leading to an efflorescence of of more faithless electors. Um, I, I suspect that. Uh, in fact, in the wake of the 2016 election, we're going to see a move towards stronger party control as state level parties are going to work harder to screen out potential faithless electors, incentivize faithful electors, and penalize them in ways that are harder to measure than has currently been done. Now, the, the critical issue, of course, is the, the level of instability in our party system today. And we know that there's a kind of a macro level instability mm -hmm. as more and more people are, are fleeing the party affiliations. But when you take a look at the kind of the micro elite party level, um, the, the state level parties are still powerful. They're still locked in um, on a legislative basis as being the gatekeepers for the selection of the electors. And, and one thing to kind of keep an eye on are these sort of, um, you know, kind of state level or even local level efforts to, uh, to disrupt the, the, the small, you know, kind of small scale party system. As, as and if that happens more, you might see uh, more faithless electors. But overall, I'm sort of like, I wanted to conclude by, you know, by quoting uh, Justice Jackson in his Ray v. Blair dissent. Um, electors, although often personally eminent, independent, and respectable, officially become voluntary party lackeys and intellectual non-entities 
to whose em uh, memory we might justly paraphrase a tuneful satire, they always vote at their party's call and never thought of thinking for themselves at all. Thank, thank you. That was just fascinating. You know, it's one of these issues that you can spend your career doing this stuff and just never think about. And the question that you ended up with, which I hope others will touch on, is as parties break down and state parties are weaker and weaker institutions, and as you get insurgent candidates who run for the destruction of all the institutions before, will this play out at the level of faithless, it's a, it's a great question. Uh, Rebecca? Great, thank you. Um, well, I'm so happy to be here. Um, thanks to the journal um, and uh, Margaret for inviting me. So I teach privacy law in addition to election law, so that's sort of the frame I approach these kinds of questions from. I'm interested in exploring uh, the effect of the passage of time and the development of technology on privacy and transparency. And someone who is sort of a great thinker in this area is Professor Lessig, who wrote a book um, called Code, where he wondered about the effect of passage of time, development of um, technology on the Fourth Amendment. And he came up with this concept of translation. And his idea was, if the founders understood uh, privacy in one way when they wrote the Fourth, <laughs> fourth, uh, the fourth Amendment, um, and we're now, as a court, interpreting uh, the Fourth Amendment today, we should try and translate their understanding of what privacy meant um, back in the day of the founding uh, to the modern context. So in thinking about the Electoral College, I thought I might try a little thought experiment along those same lines. So the original design of elector discretion in the Electoral College was to serve as a check on popular will. In Federalist 68, uh, Hamilton emphasized that the Electoral College me mechanism is principally a check on popular will. One of his uh, so, sort of biggest concerns, of course, uh, was corruption. Praising the design of the Electoral College, he believed its detached and divided situation will expose electors much less to heats and ferments. He explained that nothing is more to be desired than that every practicable obstacle should be opposed to cabal, intrigue, and corruption. And he was especially worried that foreign powers would gain an improper ascendant in our councils. Hamilton saw the Electoral College design with electoral discretion at its core uh, as a bulwark to protect against these exact dangers. And two preconditions of his design um, and life in post-revolutionary America secured these goals. Number one, the temporal nature of electors. And number two, the dispersion of those electors throughout the 13 states. Uh, but as we all know, neither of those assumptions functions today. As Victoria mentioned, if you Google uh, the words electoral college harassment in 2016, you will be treated to a barrage of search results that include um, electors experiencing death threats, um, phone calls, um, you know, bushels full of mail, and so forth. Um, and I think it's likely um, to assume that this phenomenon will only get worse uh, in 2020 and beyond. So how to achieve Hamilton's protections of electors of yesteryear in the modern day? Uh, one idea would be to allow electors to cast their ballots in secret. To use Professor Lessig's word, this would translate a constitutional command into the modern day. Um, I might add that I think it's prob probably also the case that in addition to um, voting in secret, they would also have to be sequestered um, if you really wanted to insulate them, sort of like a jury. You know, you, you put, them, put, them in a, put them in a room starting on election day until they cast their ballots, which of course, this is all fantasy, but I'm just, just work with me for a second on this idea. Um, so, when the framers instituted the Electoral College, um, there was disagreement about whether um, the original intent was, intent was for electors to cast their ballots in secret. Um, certainly at the time, uh, secret ballots weren't you know, commonly used. Um, people, a lot of times uh, in the founding era, vote, voted by voice. Um, secret ballots came only later in response to concerns about vote corruption, vote buying, and undue influence, and so forth. 
Um, the motivation behind the secret ballot uh, in, in the popular vote was, of course, to wipe away those plagues. Uh, just as a secret ballot was necessary um, as an innovation in the face of the expansion of the franchise, maybe the secret ballot is necessary now to effectuate the founders' original intent that the Electoral College act as a check uh, on popular will. So among the very many problems with this uh, arrangement um, is that pesky popular vote. Uh, if Americans couldn't be assured that their electors were going to vote um, in accordance with popular will, there would certainly be um, popular unrest, to say the least. The election system as we know it would be thrust into chaos. It would be essentially rendered meaningless. Um, and in that sense, uh, the, a proposal to make the Electoral College vote secret is um, entirely ridiculous. Um, and in fact, if such a system ever were instituted, I think it's fair to say that it would accomplish Professor Lessig's goal of hastening some kind of um, constitutional amendment or, or change. But I think it's important to note that it's not totally out of left field. Until 2008, Minnesota electors cast their ballots in secret. Um, in their briefs in both Baca and uh, Chiafo, the parties argued over whether the Electoral College's original design contemplated the secret ballot. Plaintiffs in both cases argued that Article 2 requires electors to vote by personal secret ballot to insulate them from cabal and intrigue. The plaintiff's argument is that states should not be able to fine uh, or punish faithless electors because according to the original design, states wouldn't even know who voted how. Scholars have uh, suggested that the constitutional command to count elector ballots would uh, be only necessary if those ballots were in fact cast in secret. And according to historians, it was only as states started to bind their electors that uh, ballot, se ballot secrecy was set aside, um, with Minnesota being the latest example. So if we were to indulge the thought um, this sort of thought experiment that electors in all 50 states would cast their uh, ballots in secret and also potentially be uh, sequestered, how would that um, play out? Well, I guess for one thing, it would all of a sudden really matter who your electors were. Instead of party lockers, lackeys, excuse me, or, um, or um, unknowns, you'd want people of real substance and commitment to public values and the common good to take over the, the charge. Um, and now, I think more than ever, um, the dangers of popular will are apparent. Um, I've been sort of surprised throughout the day that the, the sort of specter of foreign interference and corruption hasn't been discussed um, more than it has, than it, than it was. Um, and so in that sense, you know, maybe the founders are right. Maybe restoring the Electoral College to its roots should be on the table. Um, as tempting as it might be to thwart popular will in our current climate, um, actually wresting the popular vote from the people, I think, is another matter entirely. Um, and I think, um, I think most people would agree that that ship has, in fact, sailed. Um, and so if you're uncomfortable with that world, as I am, um, and you think it is too late to take um, the power to elect our president away from voters, um, then I think that taking the, um, the argument for electoral discretion to its logical extension, as I have over the last few minutes, I think exposes that true elector discretion is a dangerous world that we don't want to be in. Um, and although it's a method of effectuating the framer's original design, I think it sets into relief uh, a reality that uh, American voters would never accept. So I'll stop there. Danielle. Thank you. Um, I, I want to say thank you to uh, the Journal and Harvard Law School for having me. Um, and uh, to all my fellow panelists, I feel like I've learned a lot while sitting up here, and especially to Victoria for actually uh, following the prompt of the <laughs> of the panel in a way that I think really set an interesting stage, and we all learned a great deal. Um, I, uh, I am not an academic. I, I'm a voting rights lawyer, and so I... I I come to all of this with kind of an orthogonal expertise. You know, I, I don't um, necessarily fit easily in, in the thinkers uh, of electoral college design, um, but there are uh, elements, but of course, uh, voting rights litigation is all about making sure that um, there's some representational equality in our democracy, and, and nothing could be more important to that than the design of our electoral college and how we choose um, our, 
our president, our, our chief leader. Um, and so in that way, you know, I have a, a great deal of normative priors about the issue as a voting rights lawyer. I think that, uh, yeah, I don't want to be in the world of allowing some, uh, you know, small group of people to make such important democratic decisions for us. And so, um, and I feel very strongly that the closer we can get uh, to true representational equality, um, to a world in which uh, the American people feel as though their voices can be heard and the system is not rigged against them, um, it, we are going to live in a better modern democracy. And a lot of my thinking is how we can take this constitution that we have that is um, in many ways uh, contradictory, especially in its con concepts of democracy and has changed over time through these piecemeal amendments such that the right to vote is never actually enshrined anywhere, but we all agree that you have it, but it's contingent um, in ways uh, that are are quite challenging as a constitutional attorney um, to navigate. Um, I, I find these questions really interesting, uh, but I also come to it uh, with a the the pessimist uh, the pessimism of a voting rights attorney in 2019 in the federal court system, um, and so I uh, I think that. I, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the litigation that's going on around some of these issues because it is the only thing that I have any expertise to share with you. Um, and I do apologize that to the extent that I'm repeating uh, discussions that have already been had because I just couldn't get here to be here for, for the entire conference, and I, I'm sad to have missed out on such great speakers. Um, the first, of course, has been discussed, mentioned at least a couple of times um, on on this panel already, which is the faithless elector case. Um, there are two cases, the Washington Supreme Court case and, and the Colorado 10th Circuit case that have now kind of presented a pretty clear split in the courts uh, where, you know, Washington Supreme Court saying you can enforce uh, rules against faithlessness in electors and, and the 10th Circuit coming to the opposite conclusion. Um, I kind of wish none of this had happened um, because I, I do think that there was kind of a a relative stasis, right? So that we've had these examples of a few faithless electors, um, but they have largely been in irrelevant circumstances that haven't really forced the issue. Um, but it seems likely now that the issue will be forced and the Supreme Court will have to speak on it. Um, and it's, it's an extraordinarily difficult question that I think was perhaps better left unsaid. Um, and so I, I think that more than anything, it is incumbent to um, on all of us to watch that case carefully and, and think hard about the arguments as they're presented to the Supreme Court and how we can best guide the court out of a thorny thicket that will continue to uh, protect our elections. Because especially in close elections, I think harassment and, and kind of the lobbying that could go on where relatively few faithless electors could make a difference and basically create a constitutional crisis that the American people are not going to stand for having a couple of people change the outcome of an election. Um, you know, it is, is dangerous and scary, and I think we should all be paying close attention. Um, I was actually kind of um, buoyed by some of your comments, uh, Victoria, that um, that perhaps there are other ways uh, other than fear of enforcement that could uh, strengthen uh, electors and uh and make faithless electors less likely, uh, you know, with stronger party control, et cetera. And think about some of those factors that you framed. Uh, if we end up in a world where the Supreme Court has kind of specifically said that electors have complete freedom, um, I think that's a world that we have to think about how we strategize um, to avoid constitutional crisis. Um, and the second is Professor Lessig's strategy around the Electoral College. I um, share all of his, I think, uh, priors about needing to spur change and needing to have a national conversation about how we decide who gets to be president. Um, and that it is uh, hopefully untenable for us to continue um, with a system long term in which a popular the popular vote is often 
um, at odds with who we decide having be the president. I hope that um, the democratic movement of the United States and of the world towards a system of more representational equality would demand that conversation. And I think we are in a logjam of trying to figure out how to force that conversation in a way that's going to make change. Um, but as um, someone working in the courts right now, I have extraordinary anxiety about the cases in particular um, and what could get said in them um, that I think is just worth considering as we think about whether or not these cases are going to make their way into the, well, they are in the circuits now and, and whether or not um, they're going to make their way up all the way to the Supreme Court, which is that um, the cases themselves could be decided in very narrow ways, um, at least if, if they are unsuccessful. They could be decided in very narrow ways about um, about the Electoral College and its position in the Constitution and whatnot. Um, but they also do uh, raise kind of fundamental questions about the scope of the First and Fourteenth Amendment rights, about one person, one vote, and what it means to our democracy and how strong that case law is, um, and the Voting Rights Act in particular. Um, and so, uh, and quite frankly. Uh, this Supreme Court and a lot of our circuits these days don't need an excuse uh, to uh, find ways to chip away at um, that contingent, the protections of that contingent fundamental right. Um, and I think it is incumbent on all of us to think about ways in which we can make sure that as the Supreme Court speaks on voting rights issues, it does so when it is confronted with the most stark pro-voter facts possible so that we can try to bolster an area of the law that has uh, struggled in recent years. Um, and particularly with respect to the Voting Rights Act, to the extent that the Voting Rights Act um, does apply to the Electoral College and how we select the Electoral College, I have extraordinary fear that the Supreme Court would say that that is not congruent and proportional to the 14th and 15th Amendment um, uh, enforcement powers. And that is something that is on the radar of every voting rights attorney already, uh, that uh, it is likely to be a, of serious concern to Chief Justice Roberts how broad Section 2 really is. Um, and, and we have already lost uh, Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, and, and, and it would be folly, I think, to say, think that Section 2 is definitely safe um, in the current jurisprudence. Um, and, and I also want to point out um, that as we open this can of worms and force this conversation, uh, which has to happen and uh, and will continue to happen at a lot of elite law schools, among other places, um, our current system is undoubtedly undemocratic um, and leads to undemocratic outcomes in some ways. It is also by far not the most undemocratic system you could imagine uh, given the constitution that we have. I mean, that's what the subject of this panel has been, that there is a not quite as outrageous as we would hope view of a world where our, our president is chosen by a group of independent thinkers. Um, and there are other ways to, uh, uh, <laughs> time. Um, yeah, so I, uh, there are other ways that could be done too that are actually happen right now in Maine and Nebraska, right, by, con by congressional district. If that were to happen, which is by far uh, not out of the realm of possibilities, it would bake in all sorts of partisan gerrymandering uh, that uh, into the electoral college that, um, uh, uh, that then the federal courts will not be able to do anything about because of recent events in uh, in Supreme Court jurisprudence on partisan gerrymandering. So we would take all the partisan gerrymandering that might be happening in, in Congress and we would import it into uh, our electoral college system. And uh, you would really have no opportunity at that point uh, to make a Voting Rights Act argument or anything like that because congressional districts are already subject to voting right, the Voting Rights Act. And so uh, they are already compliant with Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act for the most part. Um, so I, there are kind of, we are unearthing a lot of a can of worms when we think about how to promote change. And so I, I 
I kind of just wanted to end with a kind of note of caution about how we tread in this area because we are in neither a particularly good place nor in the worst possible place when it comes to how we decide the, who the president is. So we have this ambiguous word in the title, courting, and two panelists decided it meant how to court them, and two decided it meant how to sue them. So this was, uh, uh, this was a, a nice democratic exercise here. Um, in terms of the question of how this gets c crystallized into a legal question that might actually lead uh, into the court system, um, there have been a couple of uh, points addressed. So. Uh, Larry at lunch, um, uh, and then again, uh, uh, Rebecca on our panel uh, suggested that the faithless elector might be the way in which this gets presented. Uh, there's another possibility that efforts at state control might, uh, might provoke the issue. That's Victoria's contribution. I want to ask the panel about what I think is the nightmare scenario, which uh, the Constitution is sort of uncertain about and has never been tested. So here's the hypothetical, and I'm going to pick the Republican Party because they have done this. Um, in the North Carolina Republican Party has shown a willingness to rip up settled institutional arrangements for temporary partisan advantage, whether it's the gubernatorial appointments or whether it's what the court can do, whether it's how many commissioners there are, et cetera, et cetera. So here's the two scenarios which one is uh, shocking and the other I think is awesome in the shock and awe sense. Um, the shocking one is the following, and I want to put these two to the panel and see what your sense of what they do for us is. The first one is, just before the election in 2020, um, the national polls indicate that uh, it will likely come down to the votes of just a couple of states, and North Carolina is one of them, and it looks like the Democratic uh, uh, contender, uh, Marion Williamson in this case, uh, um, has a mild advantage or a substantial advantage, I don't care. And so a week before the election, the North Carolina legislature decides it will abolish elect popular election for the electors and appoint them in the manner in which they say. And they say they will be the Republican slate of electors. So that's the shocking one. Does the Constitution, clearly our popular consciousness does not tolerate that, but does the Constitution tolerate that? The awesome one is that they do so a week after the election when the Democratic candidate has carried North Carolina, but within the time frame specified by the Electoral Count Act so that the federal statutory issue doesn't come into, into play. And so they say, we are simply overturning the election. They won't use those terms. The people have spoken erroneously. And in order to correct the mistake that was made, the legislature hereby designates that the following is the North Carolina slate of electors. So do we have any constitutional protection uh, on that score? There will be political outrage and all that, and maybe that will prompt Supreme Court review and constitutional amendment. But is that tolerable within our current constitutional framework? So Go ahead. I, I, this, is a, this raises my opportunity to talk about one of my favorite things, which is Section 2 of the 14th Amendment. When the right, for North Carolina, when the right to vote at any election for the choice of electors for president and vice president of the United States is denied to any of the um, dot, 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 it, any of the male inhabitants, dot, 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 the basis of representation therein shall be reduced. So is there a section two? Nope. No, it, reduces, yeah. it may reduce their congressional delegation going forward. But, they but it doesn't, president. but they still got the president. Yeah. Yeah. Gee, you're from North Carolina. This is your fault. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and how, but how, and how um, would we reduce that representation? You know. Okay, yeah. so so I so the, your version of this question reminds me. I started teaching um, the fall of 2000, um, and we were having um, similar types of scenario questions. 
um, around that time. And the, and, the, and the ultimate question really was, what is the role of the Supreme Court in resolving a difficult national election dispute? Right, with um, some, I had a discussion in the faculty lounge with my colleagues then at the University of Minnesota, with some saying um, there's no role for the court at all to play, um, and with others saying no, the court eventually essentially has to be to serve sort of the centralized dispute resolution role um, that is sometimes served in other contexts and in, in, in other countries. Um, now, if you were to ask me, you know, if you as, as you are, uh, <laughs> what would it's happen? A, it's not a hypo. I am. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you are asking what would happen in this context. My best guess is that we would see a relative replay of the Bush v. Gore scenario, um, with then the court deciding what does really now what does legislature mean. And my guess, um, this would be similar to um, the way that the Chief Justice. I think, thought about the citizenship question when it became really clear as to how um, um, the, the fact that the government was plainly lying uh, and attempting to, to gain a particular advantage, my guess is that we would have an understanding of legislature that would be um, interpreted differently than it would have otherwise been interpreted in different types of context. You're referring so, to the census case. Yes, the census case, yes. Yeah. Um, so, so that's my guess as to what, is, what the steps are will likely happen is similar pattern to what we saw in Bush v. Gore with the court playing the role of dispute resolution in a way that I don't think um, would enable a state like North Carolina to um, play this blatant. But, but could you identify what is the constitutional dispute here? Because the text seems to say very clearly the legislature can do this. I mean, we have this arcane instrument that is so at sure. odds, and, and it seems that this is within the bounds of this is, this, I think this gets to the problem of all these all these discussions. Uh, Rebecca, you wanted to jump in. So. Well, yes. Yeah, I mean, I think that put that really puts the nail on the head of why this, the, it really hits the nail on the head, <laughs> sorry, um, about, about yeah, <laughs> about why the design of the Electoral College is so preposterous. I mean, if you, it, it's almost like if you take these arguments to the logical conclusion, legislators are empowered with that kind of ability. So, you know, I think the answer is, you know, we need to fix it. We need to fix it. I mean, I agree with that. I, I have a, as far as just predictions go, you know, for the hypothetical, of course, it's, it's hard to even imagine the level of crisis that would be in the country if, if something like that happened. Um, I actually tend to predict that it would come out differently in your shock and awe categories, um, right? So I think in the shocking category of North Carolina doing this before the election, but just based on prognostication, I actually think there's a decent chance it's upheld, but it would be so outrageous that it would force a great deal of change. Maybe that's how we get to our constitutional amendment. But um, I, I tend to think that the institution is very arcane and it, it is hard to imagine a legislator, uh, this Supreme Court, tr reaching so far outside of the text of the, of the Constitution to resolve the problem. Um, and so... I, I'm at a loss. I think I think it would likely be upheld. I think that the after the election question is a much closer one, and I think that that gives the the would give the court at least a little bit of space to play with um, to to rule uh, in a way that would obviously be in accordance with the populace and and the sense of the populace, and that would be that in a Bush v. Gore like way to say once you have extended the right to vote, you cannot then nullify it. Um, like so, once it has been extended, it is therefore fundamental and is protected, and you cannot kind of retroactively. Um, nullify it. So I actually think that they probably come out differently um, depending on, on which of those scenarios. And, and you could argue that in the first scenario, well, then the candidates are on notice that this is how things are going to go down. So they should shift their energies elsewhere, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a nightmare for sure, but I do think they come out differently. So all of these are attempts to tease out the conflict between our culture and our institutional arrangements. There's hands all over the place, Larry. <laughs> uh. So I, I, 
I want to make sure it's clear. So Danielle was actually talking about two separate lines of cases. Um, one line was the electoral freedom cases, the Baca and the Chapulo, and the other was the case that David Boyes was, was litigating. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit more about the Chapulo case um, because uh, you know, first it's important to recognize that though it seems kind of opportunistic to take the case, we actually feel and felt that it was incredibly important to resolve the case in the context in which we're resolving it. I mean, I think Jesse might mention this. I hadn't known this until today. In 2000, the Bush people, when they expected they might be losing, um, uh, even though they uh, won the popular vote, were thinking about persuading faithless people to be, quote, faithless electors in that context, too. And, and the likelihood that we're going to confront this seems to be slightly different behind. So we ought to obviously be confronting it in this kind of strategy. But the other part, like, you know, advocate for my clients a little bit more clearly, you know, I think it's a really bad word to call them faithless electors. When you talk to these electors, they really believe, Giacomo especially, that they were trying to act in the interest of the people who they were supposed to be representing. Now, they saw that uh, likelihood was that Donald Trump was going to be elected. And they knew the people who would vote for Hillary Clinton did not want Donald Trump to be elected. So they were trying to act in a way that was advancing the interests of the people who had, in fact, voted for them. And what they thought in the Hamilton elector of all, which I think it probably was, <laughs> was that they could get enough votes to at least shift it to a candidate who was closer to Hillary Clinton than to Donald Trump. Now, that's not faithlessness. I mean, there have been faithless electors in the sense that they want to vote for some you know, Native American tribe leader or you know, some crazy person just to assert their independence and right to speak, but these people were actually acting with the interest of their voters in mind in a way that was to advance that. Um, and the real question is whether that should be allowed. Now, I know because one of our clients in the record this other case, who was working very closely with a bunch of Republican electors, who believed that he had more than 20 Republican electors who would vote against Trump, the biggest thing he was confronting is that a bunch of those electors said, yeah, but I, I, I'm not allowed to. It's against the law. So there's a really genuine question here. There's a real belief that they need to do what's important. A bunch of these people thought they ought to be upholding the will of the people and the nation as a whole and vote against you know, where they were um, led. And, and so I think that this is more complicated than just imagining a bunch of crazy people being, quote, faithless in the context of the election. Okay. Alex? Yeah, just uh, to my, part of my role in life is to provide historical gloss of our constitutional questions over the years. Precisely the scenario you're describing happened in North Carolina in 18. <laughs> um, Was that Dee's fault? <laughs> <laughs> um, the, ele the legislature canceled the election, I think it was about a week before, mm -hmm. um, because they were afraid that it was going to go the other way and said, we'll, we'll take care of this ourselves. And several other states <coughs> similar things. And it were those events, I don't think it landed in the courts, but it was those events that precipitated the whole wave of constitutional amendments that began in 1813 and ran into the 1820s, which were designed not only to get rid of take, win or take all, but to guarantee that every state held a popular election. Um, yeah. and just to follow up on that, and to agree with Danielle, it seems to me that the brief, one reason why the second scenario, the awesome scenario, would be different is well, two things. One is there's this uh, Roe versus Alabama precedent that uh, Sam, you know from a disputed uh, Alabama election around 1995 that says it's a due process violation to change the rules for counting ballots after they've been cast. So it does seem to me that if the election has been held, there'd be a serious due process claim. It's debatable whether the Supreme Court precedent would agree with Roe, well, but the, I think the instinct is probably that it would. The other thing is, if you asked about the Constitution, but it also but it also has to be pursuant to a law in place on the date of the popular vote. So any change in the rules would affect state, state harbor status. The Constitution gives um, <coughs> Congress the power to set the time for the electors to be chosen. In 1845, they set it to the Tuesday following the first Monday 
held an election for the purpose of choosing electors and has failed to make a choice on the day prescribed by law. The electors may be appointed on a subsequent day in a manner, uh, as the legislature of such state may direct. The second scenario is clearly a violation of sections one and two of Title III. The, the former, where they change the law, they change the process before the election. Fortunately, North Carolina has a, has a Democratic governor. And so politically, this may depend on whether the North Carolina legislature can agree on a joint resolution that doesn't require the governor's signature, which I don't think they can. So these are technical questions that came up. <laughs> came up no, they came up in 2000 because the, the, the independent legislature provision of Article 2 may not require a gubernatorial signature on anything they do. This is an unknown area. McPherson versus Blacker introduces confusion on this point. This is an unknown point. On the second point, you're absolutely, the first point, you're absolutely right. That's what the title provides. I don't know whether Congress has that authority. And again, congressional authority, even on the 1842 statute, on, uh, on single member districts for Congress. That's not never been tested constitutionally. These are, these are boundaries. And if you're thinking about things that might push the courts to have to get involved, this is where, this is why I raise this as a- By the as, way, Sam, this is also where push v. Gore's contingent right might come into play. Like, yeah. Once you've provided the right to vote, yeah. then it is, a, is fundamental. Right. And so taking it away might pose the problems, right? That's one way of beginning to think through that as well. Sam? I hate to get into the technical weeds, but um, it might be time to channel those inner federalists and say that in the case of North Carolina, as in many states, there are free and equal election clauses. In Article 6 of the Constitution of North Carolina, furthermore specifies ways in which voters may be eligible to vote for president and vice president, which means that there's an implicit right to vote for them. And so I think many of you all know, especially if you do, uh, I think many of you all know that, that the current state Supreme Court of North Carolina is actually pretty friendly to voting rights. So if we're going to get into the weeds, then it turns out. Well, if you want to get into the weeds on, on law, Sam. <laughs> McPherson versus Blacker leaves open whether the state constitution has authority over this, whether the state Supreme Court has authority over this. The remand in, in Bush v. Palm Beach County left this question on the table and said, please don't force us to address this question. The independent state legislature provision of Article 2 may on one reading, and McPherson versus Blacker gives strong support for this, preempt all other state actors other than the legislature acting in its own capacity. This is a hotly so contested. all that would like get yes. would get dis yes. would disappear. Would this is disappear. The question we asked Jack last night. What does right does historically legislature really mean legislature? Okay, so Jack, <laughs> you're next. <laughs> well, I was gonna say something else, which is I mean this comes in the in the Arizona case. Yes, that's right. Uh, legislature and legislative are sometimes used synonymously, often used synonymously in the 17th and 18th century. So with the people of the state acting constitutionally, have chosen to delegate a power deemed legislative to an independent commission. Chief Justice Roberts didn't like this in, uh, in, in the Arizona case, but um, RBG like, actually might agree with all <laughs> so, yeah, I feel very good about this. <laughs> that's, that's Can I ask another question? Yes, yeah, yeah. So, Rebecca, this goes to your point. And, and not, you, not that you resolve this satisfactorily, but go ahead, go ahead, move on. <laughs> but so, Rebecca, this goes to your point, which I think is a point that Larry is also forced to suggest. So, the key, key phrase here is that the electors may be a check upon popular will, which is, seems to be validated by the counters of electors derived from Federal 68. I, I think that's a big mistake. Uh, at least if you want to take a strong originalist position in terms of what was being contemplated at the time the Constitution was written. So I try to suggest this morning there are three alternative modes of trying to think about how, you know, how the president might be elected. And you know, popular elections one, legislative elections the second, having the electors be at least the initial voice was the third. So the idea that there, and it's true, happens in census. He says at the point, though, where the discussion is quite open and there's no occasion for reaction because, again, in the first two presidential elections, doesn't matter what rule you follow, you're always going to get the same result. 
So I, so I think the idea of a checking function, though, you know, it is in a sense, you know, plausible because it is, it's there at the Federalist. I just completed editing the Cambridge Companion to the Federalist, so I do have to draw a on the subject. So I mean, it is a plausible position. I don't think it's well sustained by the actual structure of the debate, which was, to my way of thinking, would make the, the whole Hamilton lecture, the lecture's notion, interesting, but highly problematic. Yeah, I, th I totally agree, and my my remarks are more sort of a thought experiment. I think I'm undercut also by Ned's, you know, argument about the 12th Amendment, so I, I think that's true, but I, it was just sort of for purposes of discussion, think thinking through some of the implications of what Hamilton was suggesting. Rob? Yeah, just to sort of uh, go back to that post-election scenario, just to sort of amplify what my neighbor was saying. So going to COSA's Every Vote Equal answering this section. Uh, so, you know, uh, the Constitution in Article 2, Section 1 says that the Congress may determine the time of choosing the electors. Rob, the can you stand and speak louder because oh, you're back. The, the Congress may determine the time of choosing the electors is in the Constitution and the day on which they give their vote. So both the, day, the choice day and the actual casting of the votes. And then Congress has, as, as he was saying, you know, specified quite specifically the day of choosing the electors is that particular Tuesday. And so they couldn't suddenly change the choice. They would be violating federal law. So, so that's, that's pretty clear. The pre-election one is a stretch, but not as, not as clear. Uh, I'm looking at the North Carolina Constitution. <laughs> Meaning of yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> more like the part of your time where the legislature's claim post facto to do a change is not purely based on we don't like the results, but some claim of some underlying problem that might occur that um, puts the popular vote in doubt, which suggests it relates to the congressional language where there might be a fig leaf argument that the popular vote has failed to happen, and in a kind of emergency circumstance, the legislature is coming in to try to, to at least have the state count in the congressional count. Right. I'm giving the North Carolina legislature its due. It will be able to say there has been a failure in the count because the wrong candidate prevailed. <laughs> and so then they go on yeah. to uh, from, from that step. Um, is there... Any other questions? So, panel, do you have more comments? No? Okay. Yes, one more question. Go ahead. So, I guess uh, I have a question just so, input designs to the Supreme Court is sort of bound on occasion to respond to public opinion. Uh, and technically, the Supreme Court has the right to make a very narrow decision, sort of like that one hyper lobby case and such. Uh, so, would they be willing to throw the nation to crisis with uh, their awesome shopping scenario? Or might they just say, like, Let's see, drawn. Let's just not deal with this. Uh, yeah, let's go back to the way things work. Or would they be willing to just go full textual and spend the GOP for the short term? I mean, my own personal instinct on that is along the lines of what I said before, which is I think that if there are close legal questions, I think they're going to all resolve them all in in the favor of you know not throwing the country into constitutional crisis. So I think actually the very um, complicated questions about l definition of legislature and all of that, they're all going to go in favor of, um, you know, allowing, they don't want to decide those things, but, you know, because they might have strong textualist views about it. But I think if the consequence is throwing the country in crisis, the court is going to resolve those pr likely in the direction that would kind of save the system. But I think the first, the the idea of, of the legislature ahead of time deciding they want to select electors separately is it's just very hard to find the close legal question to to do what you suggest right which is to follow popular opinion to kind of err on they still have to write an opinion they still have to have a legal analysis and I think that's where it gets much much harder I'm sure uh, much better lawyers than me will figure out a way to try to give them that path um, but it's it's hard. Let me just reinforce what Danielle said, which I agree with fully. Um, we forget the history that led up to Bush v. Gore. I mean, what the court did first when Bush v. Palm Beach County was say to the Florida Supreme Court, 
please don't make us do this. Here's the path by which you can resolve this under Florida law, paying attention to what we think is the basic principle, which is make sure you're following the procedures which were in place ahead of time. And here's how you get to that. And Ginsburg wrote basically the advisory opinion for the Florida Supreme Court. The Florida Supreme Court repudiated it. Then there were two paths that were going up at the same time. One came through the Florida Supreme Court. The other one was the litigation that was taking place in the federal courts under the uh, Roe v. Alabama line of cases that uh, um, that Ned referred to. And those were on hold in the U.S. Supreme Court. So they had they were going to have to, and they were going to come out opposite directions. There was just no way they were going to duck it. You can criticize Bush v. Gore, you can do all this, but to read into that an adventuresome spirit on the part of the U.S. Supreme Court to jump into a failed presidential election is, I think, extraordinary. And so I, I fully agree that the institutional self-preservation and conservatism of the Supreme Court will do everything possible to reinforce the perception of how elections are supposed to work. The problem, the reason I raise these scenarios is because the perception is so shockingly at odds with the text at this point that, and the partisan divides are so great right now that it's we're in a precarious situation, I think. Yeah, but just, just something to add to that though, Sam. It is true, however, that the court didn't have to stop the count in Bush versus Gore, right? That's a separate and, issue. Yeah, so, so there it is expressing sort of, um, yes, there's a reluctance to jump in, but there's also not a reluctance to resolve, right, at the end of the day, in a, in a space in which it didn't absolutely have to. So I, that, I agree with you that there, there's a lot going on here in terms of the incongruity between sort of the, the culture, the constitutional structure, um, the, the court itself. But in some ways, Bush v. Gore sets the precedent for the fact that if at the end of the day they have to, um, it's not clear that that they won't, right? That is, that, that sets a possibility that they, in fact, will. Yes, I agree with that. Okay, we are at, we are one minute short of our stopping time. So uh, let's thank the panel. People that I've been reading and studying and in, in many cases interviewing. Um, and so it's a thrill just to, to sit here and listen uh, all day, but I also feel a bit like an imposter. Um, I wasn't, I think I, I wasn't quite smart enough to be in the academy, uh, but I was smart enough to get a job that would allow me to hang out with all of you uh, and, uh, and ask you questions and learn, uh, learn from you and then uh, do my best to translate that uh, to the uh, general public. Um, I also wish I could have written this book after today's conference. <laughs> Uh, there have been uh, more more things have come up than I can than I can even count that I would have liked to include. Um, uh, so, um, you know, one of the I think exciting but also daunting things about the electoral college and and writing about it is that once you start, uh, you realize how deeply connected it is to so many other really large topics. Um, you know, the history of the idea of democracy, the meaning of equality, the development of representative government, the nature of political parties, the role of slavery in the American constitutional design and its function, um, the Trump presidency. <laughs> uh, you know, I, my, um, my, book's, uh, my book's subtitle is The Case for Abolishing the Electoral College. And uh, more than one person has suggested to me that the rest of the book could consist of just two words, Donald Trump, uh, uh, which would have made my job easier. Um, but I, Speaking of our, our current president, I want to tell you just a, a, a story about my job, um, which I hope is going to shed some light on some of the themes we've been discussing here today and on the way that uh, the American people think about electing their president. So this is back in, in uh, mid-December of 2016. I decided I wanted to write my first editorial uh, about the Electoral College. Um, Donald Trump has won the presidency despite trailing Hillary Clinton by nearly three million votes. People are in shock, people are furious, they can't understand how this could happen again. So I write the editorial, it's titled, Time to End the Electoral College. Very Times editorial headline. Um, so 
the New York Times editorial board is a, a precedential institution, not unlike the Supreme Court, uh, or like the Supreme Court used to be. Um, we, we change positions very rarely, and only after a lot of internal debate. That includes the publisher and uh, the editorial page editor and all of the editorial board members. And when we write that editorial, we go to pains to explain why we've changed. So there I was uh, banging out this editorial, glowing with my righteous Timesian indignation. Uh, I explained everything that was unfair or undemocratic about the college, all the things that we've been talking about today that you know about. Um, I advocated for the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. Um, I knew that I was making a pretty strong argument. Uh, I realized it would be an even stronger argument if I could demonstrate that this was not a conveniently timed partisan ploy but uh, rather a principled stand the Times had always taken. So I went back through our editorial archives and I found dozens of editorials on the Electoral College. Uh, there was one from 2012, which was the year before I joined the board. There was one from 2010. There was one from 2008, from 2006, from 2004. I found them from the late 1960s, which, you know, of course, that was, as we've been talking about today, when the nation came closer to... Uh, adopting a popular vote than it ever has. Um, uh, I even found one from 1936. In every case, whether it was a Republican or a Democrat who'd won the White House, we supported the popular vote. So I wrote, this page has opposed the Electoral College for at least 80 years, and it has regardless of the outcome of any given election. I even linked to the 1936 editorial just because I was so proud of my research First rule of journalism is never say always, <laughs> unless you absolutely have to. The piece runs, it gets a huge response, thousands of comments from popular vote advocates, electoral college defenders all over the country, and then there's always a few coming from New Zealand who are always like, what is wrong with you people? <laughs> anyway, the piece is published on December 19th. On December 20th, I get an email from a former editorial board member now living overseas. He cites my line about the 80 years of opposing the college, and he writes, surely you remember when the NY Times editorially supported retaining the Electoral College on December 19th, 2000. Uh, no, I did not. <laughs> I looked it up, and he was right. 16 years to the day before my own Jeremiah, and one week after the Supreme Court had voted to end the Florida recount and effectively award the presidency to George W. Bush, the board had come out unequivocally in favor of the Electoral College. Why? Because the college was, in its words, first and foremost, a compact among states, large and small, designed to ensure that one state or one region did not dominate the others. Quote, this in turn required presidential candidates to build alliances across ideological and geographical lines. The editorial then rejected the idea that we are one homogenous, undifferentiated mass. And it said, there are still definably Midwestern interests or Northwestern interests, as opposed to, say, Eastern interests. There are still definably rural interests, just as there are urban interests. And it called a new proposal to abolish the Electoral College, introduced by then-Senator-elect Hillary Rodham Clinton, a, quote, mistake. The irony. <laughs> uh, <laughs> There are benefits to the college, the editorial said, that, quote, outweigh the majoritarian case put forward by Mrs. Clinton and others. I liked others. Some of the others, besides Hillary Clinton, who have made a majoritarian case for a popular vote, include James Madison, James Wilson, Governor Morris, Thomas Jefferson. Anyway, I was mortified. I had gone through decades of editorials. Somehow, I had forgotten to check the most important one of all. How could this happen? Despite the claims from certain world leaders, we really do try to get our facts right, and it is bad when we get them wrong. We have to run a correction. It goes in our file for the year-end review, and so on. So <laughs> as you might imagine, the right-wing blogs had a field day. The New York Times can't even get its own position on the Electoral College right. Of course, they neglected to note that the one time we come out in favor of the defense, in, in favor of the college, it was when it awarded the presidency to a popular vote losing Republican, but I digress. Anyway, we fixed the mistake quickly enough. The correction ran the next day in the print edition. I cut it out. I taped it to my computer monitor as a constant rebuke to myself 
and we moved on. So that's my little tale of self-inflicted woe, but what broader lessons can we take from it? I can think of at least four. One is never forget the election of 2000. It started uh, the modern movement to abolish the college. Uh, at the time, no living American had seen a split election. Now we've seen two in less than 20 years. I'll just note here that for all the hubbub of 2016, it was actually a pretty clean split election with none of the recount dramas of 2000 or of 1876. Um, there were a few calls for recounts uh, in the key battleground states, but those really wouldn't have made any difference. In fact, the only person who has continued to insist that the 2016 election was rigged is Donald Trump, a curious complaint coming from the victor. But it makes sense if you believe that the popular vote is the truest measure of electoral legitimacy. Two, never underestimate the power of institutional inertia. After my mix-up in 2016, I did some reporting to figure out what had happened back in 2000. Remember I said the Times takes reversals very seriously, and yet that 2000 editorial defending the college had not made any reference to any prior editorial opposing it, and it has not been cited once by any editorial since. Why? For various reasons, I was unable to identify with certainty the author of that editorial, but I can offer some educated guesses for why it came to be. I think of it now sort of like our own Bush v. Gore. Uh, uh, someone said earlier, a one-ride ticket, not meant to serve as precedent, but only to soothe the jangled nerves of a traumatized nation. Don't worry, it seemed to be saying, the republic will be fine. Our institutions are wise, they are stable, and they are enduring. That this argument would be made by the editorial page of the New York Times at a moment when the Electoral College had just operated to deny the White House to the popular vote winning Democrat illustrates the power of our impulse to protect the systems we already know. Three, the same persistent myths have propped up the college for a long time. And any effort to dramatically reform or dismantle that the college will need to blow up those myths. After the Times ran its 2000 editorial, Akhil Amar at Yale, was more than a bit upset. Only a few weeks earlier, Akhil had written his own op-ed for the Times, in which he explained how the college's creation in 1787 was inseparable from the practice and the preservation of slavery, and that it had benefited the slave states in the early years of the Republic. So he wrote later, the Electoral College's adoption was not first and foremost about big states versus small states, it was much more about slavery. I had explained this to the Times itself, Akhil said. Didn't these guys read their own paper? Then I calmed down. The standard story, this is Akhil still writing, the standard stories about the Electoral College have been circulating for a very long time, and it would take time for the new story to soak in. Well-educated people like the Times editorial board would need not just to learn something new, but to unlearn something old, and unlearning is not easy or quick. I think Akhil is right. The myths are so deeply ingrained that most of us just keep repeating them without any awareness of where they actually, whether they actually correspond to reality. Jamel Bowie, the wonderful uh, New York Times columnist who joined uh, last year, he calls these beliefs folk civics. And I, I do think I we've been talking a lot about the small state myth in particular and how it's both um, wrong as a matter of, uh, uh, um, it's, it's, it's wrong as an empirical matter, but it's also wrong that uh, through much of history, small states have even cared about this. And uh, I think it was um, Barry Burden on one of the earlier panels uh, suggested that, um, or, or pointed out that the small state myth really wasn't a myth for a long time. It wasn't, it wasn't even discussed uh, for, many of the, for, for much of the beginning of the, of, of the, of the nation's uh, history, and that it only came up in, in the more recent past. And you know, I was thinking, why would that be? And it, it occurred to me that it might be because it, it wasn't needed earlier. Um, you know, to the extent that, this, that, that the history of the country is this arc of democratization, there were a lot more exclusionary electoral practices in place um, then. And as each of those has been stripped away, what's left? We have two anti-majoritarian electoral structures remaining, the Senate and the Electoral College, right? So I call this the plus two fallacy. The Senate very clearly benefits the small states. Nobody doubts that. And because the Senate's plus, you know, the Senate's two, each, each state gets its two electors from the Senate, people assume, I think, and maybe want to believe, that the Senate, uh, the power that the small states get from the Senate is translated directly into the 
into the house, uh, into the um, electoral college. I mean, we know that clearly that's not true. A, they're mixed with the house, the, the, the electors from the house, and B, uh, winner take all, you know, pretty much completely wipes out the, the power of the small states. But I, I, I think that's just one possible explanation for why the small state myth has really um, uh, risen to prominence in the last few decades. They don't. There's nothing else left. Um, uh, and this brings us to the fourth lesson, which is uh, the importance of remembering how different the public's understanding of the electoral college is from that of the people in this room. Um, as Larry, I think, rightly reminded us last night, most Americans are unmoved by even, even the most pressing debates uh, over electoral reform. But the Electoral College is different. People care, and they get very emotional about how we elect the president. Um, I'm, I've, I've already experienced it in writing these editorials about the college, and I'm expecting a lot more uh, incoming when the book comes out uh, next spring. Um, some of the emotion, of course, reflects an intense desire to win, to see, uh, you know, your man or woman in the Oval Office. But I, I also think a significant part of it derives from our common democratic, small d, democratic heritage. The belief that in a democracy it is simply not right for the loser to win. This runs very deep and has always transcended party lines. Um, I think, uh, you know, this whole idea of, um, you know, I think uh, Alex earlier was talking about uh, the crisis, you know, the crisis of, of, a, of a split election. And um, Sam uh, Wong earlier said that, you know, we, we were talking about the risk of what would happen, you know, the risk of, of a popular vote loser being uh, elected to the presidency, um, being, you know, 30 percent, given a, given a certain vote margin. I think, why, why do we use this, this language? Why do we talk about a crisis and a risk, right? If the Electoral College is a, is a good thing, if it was a smart design, if it's there for good reasons, that's not, a, that's not a crisis, that's not a risk, that's just how the system works. It doesn't matter who wins the popular vote, it matters who wins the Electoral College. I think the answer, why we speak in that language and why people freak out when it happens is obvious. People don't want the loser to win the election. That's just the majority rule is the, is the, is the lodestar of our modern democratic uh, uh, ideology. Um, so I think when Americans are most aware of that violation, and of the violations of political equality that, are, that the state winner take all rules generate, I think that's when the mood for reform is the strongest. Um, you know, we, we cite this statistic that there have been 700, I think Alex said 700 to 1,000 efforts to amend or abolish the college uh, uh, in Congress. This gives the impression that it's been under constant assault. And in a sense that's true, but of course, I think we've really only gotten very close once, and that was in the second half of the 1960s when Senator Birch Bayh, uh, who died earlier this year, spearheaded a, uh, a four-year effort to pass a constitutional amendment abolishing the college and switching to a direct vote. I, it's important to remember this was a bipartisan project that over the years won the support of President Nixon, Bob Dole, George Bush Sr., um, and in 1969, uh, as was pointed out earlier, the amendment passed the House overwhelmingly. I think the vote was 339 to 70. Uh, it had the support of dozens of states, state legislatures, and it seemed like it might have a real chance in the Senate until it was filibustered to death by three Southern segregationists uh, who still had not come to terms with the civil rights movement. Um, for reasons that I struggle to understand, this story, um, which I also recount in the book, has disappeared down the American memory hole. Uh, I, I talked to people who were fully sentient humans uh, at the time of, of, you know, this when this happened in 1969, 70, and into the early 70s, and virtually all of them have completely forgotten it. What stands out for me about that moment was the way that Senator Bai managed to, to uh, uh, pull together this national coalition. And I should also say, um, as, as was pointed out in an earlier panel, I, I, I think, at least in my book, I give short shrift to, to Manny Seller. Uh, I would love to know more. It, just from what I was hearing today, it, he sounds like a, a, a much more interesting and important character in all of this than I had realized. So um, I apologize. Uh, retrospectively. Um, but you know, this was something that Guy said, and I think was so important in just this last panel, which is the, 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 the value and the importance of articulating um, the, the ideal of political equality uh, as a way to break through uh, 
our, our current polarization and the current barriers between the parties, just how important that is. I think Birch Bay really did that. Um, you know, his, he, he gave a speech. Uh, he, was, he was initially an elect, uh, a national popular vote skeptic. And after several months of holding hearings on the matter, um, he uh, came around. He had a conversion. And he gives this, he gives this really remarkable speech uh, on May 18th, 1966. And it's worth, I commend it to you, it's worth looking up and reading in full. It's not long. It's about, uh, you know, it's, it's probably not even a thousand pages long. It's shorter than what I'm saying right here. And it's, it's one of the most, um, uh, I think, beautifully spoken and articulate and uh, um, co comprehensive uh, um, advocate, advocacy, uh, ar you know, arguments in favor of the popular vote that I've ever read. Um, and what he really does is he weaves together the threads of that democratic evolution, that America's expanding democracy, you know, from the, you know, from the elimination of pro property requirements to the enfranchisement of black people and the enfranchisement of women, direct vote of senators. Uh, then we have the one person, one vote ruling in the 1960s, the abolition of the poll tax, the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act. He pulls it all together in the service of explaining why a direct vote for president was the next natural step in that process. And it's, it was re there was no way to there was no way to really uh, oppose it other than to to have a filibuster, which is essentially you know a temper tantrum. Um, in uh, you know, in the book I write, I, I I I the way I describe this is I say maybe this is the real American exceptionalism. Our nation was conceived out of the audacious, world changing idea of universal human suff of universal human equality, and though it was born in a snarl of prejudice, mistrust, and exclusion. It harbored in its DNA the code to express more faithfully the true meaning of its founding principles. Over multiple generations, and thanks to the tireless work and bloody sacrifices of millions of Americans, some powerful but most just regular people who wanted to be treated the same as everyone else, that code has been unlocked, and those principles slowly but surely have found expression. And I really think that idea, the idea of vindicating the principle of political equality um, uh, as Guy mentioned, is really is really at the heart of all of this, and could be the thing that that pushes us forward. Um, you know, by the by the end of Bai's effort, you know, his primary effort, which was in 1970, 80, eight, more than 80 percent of the country was in favor of a popular vote for president. So now here we are, 50 years later, uh, and instead of an amendment on the table, we have this interstate compact, as well as many of the other ideas that have been uh, floated today. And we sort of it's a way interesting full circle that we've come from trying to rewrite the Constitution to trying to work within it. Um, of course, the battle is more polarized right now, but thats I don't think that's a reason to back down. Last night, we were talking about the fragility of this particular moment um, as author authoritarianism and disinformation and incalculable amounts of money and politics are operating together to pose an existential threat to constitutional democracy here and around the world. I can't speak for what happens in other countries, but uh, here, presidents elected by the American people as a whole, with all votes counting and all votes mattering equally, and the winner being the person who gets m the most, I think uh, would, be an, it would be one of the most important things we could do to buttress our own constitutional democracy. I'm not sure what the path to a national popular vote will look like in the end, and I'm even less certain after today, um, or how long it will take us to get there, or how many more obstacles and setbacks we'll face along the way. But I do feel sure that, that these core values of both political equality and majority rule will be the lights guiding us along that path. Thanks. Thanks.